Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Kim Brown in Baltimore. October 29th marks the four-year anniversary of Superstorm Sandy that devastated parts of the Northeast U.S. in 2012, including coastal areas of New York City, killing more than 120 people and causing some $70 billion worth of property damage. Now, four years on and more extreme weather events are ravaging the United States due to climate change, such as the recent Hurricane Matthew that pounded the Carolinas and caused an estimated billion and a half dollars in damage to buildings in North Carolina. Now, a recent study from the National Academy of Sciences sought to figure out how much flooding like those caused by Hurricane Sandy in the U.S. would impact states of New York and New Jersey. And it found that hurricanes could start flooding New York City's coastline as often as every 20 years due to the effects of climate change on sea level rise and hurricane activity. So are we any more prepared to deal with megastorms and hurricanes since Sandy and have the communities affected been able to recover these years later. Well, with us today to discuss this is Jeff Schlegelmich. He is the deputy director for the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at Columbia University's Earth Institute. In this role, he oversees the operations and strategic planning for the center, as well as the projects related to the practice and policy of disaster preparedness. Jeff, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. Well, first, can you talk about Superstorm Sandy in the context of climate change disruption? Or is, is it more appropriate to label it as an extreme weather event linked to climate change? Yeah, it, it's, it's very difficult to attribute very specific events, especially very specific extreme weather events to climate change. And one of the challenges with that is just that there, there isn't a lot of historical data on extreme weather events and some of the modeling that's used to, to make those attribution just has some, some challenges behind it. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that with climate change, we will see more extreme weather events. Um, those events can include those like uh, Superstorm Sandy uh, in some parts of the country, in some parts of the world. But may also uh, come about as drought and other places getting drier as a result of it. Um, but, but I think it is fair to say that, that the weather is, is a little less predictable than it has been in the past. And as we see the effects of climate change, we are going to see more extreme events. So there was a lot of criticism at the time that FEMA did not move fast enough and that it fell to volunteers and members of, uh, of Occupy Sandy, who were formerly Occupy Wall Street, to step in and help people who were displaced by the storm. And can you comment on that? Yeah, you know, I, I think in a lot of disasters, there's there's an expectation of FEMA to be on the ground very quickly, and I think that it is perfectly fair uh, with the uh, tax dollars that go into building our emergency response systems that we do expect uh, a high, higher level of action and faster response from them. But it's also worth noting that FEMA is actually not a first responder per se. Uh, FEMA is a federal agency that's brought in uh, once the impacts of the disasters are known are able to be anticipated as a backstop once the local and state resources have either been exhausted or anticipated to be exhausted. So with that being said, uh, uh, Occupy Sandy uh, community base groups at Neighbors Helping Neighbors will always be the first line of defense against disasters. Uh, you're always going to be able to help out your neighbor or them help out you uh, prior to FEMA coming on board or, or any response agency being there first. But with that being said, I think that there has been a lot of criticism, uh, both in terms of the response uh, of being able to get there, there quickly enough, but I think more importantly in the recovery phase where a lot of money was made available, uh, but to this day we still see thousands of people not yet able to return home as a result of the, the lengthy bureaucracy that's involved with the recovery process. Some of that is owned by FEMA and the process is there, but a lot of that also comes down through the states and through the localities and the programs that are set up to manage that, which sort of create additional layers um, as those pathways are used to try to get money to people to get them back in their homes. Does there seem to be, at least in, in your observation or experience, more of a priority to reopen sort of commercial areas rather, uh, well, more so as a priority to make sure, I'm talking about New Jersey actually, for example, um, the, the, the boardwalk there that was washed away during Hurricane Sandy, I believe that has been re rebuilt, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, but yet there's still thousands of people who are not able to return to their homes. Does there seem to be more of a priority from the state level to make sure that the commercial touristy areas are restored faster than, than those of the residential areas? 
Well, I, I don't know specifically what the, what the decision making was at the state level, but I do know that, that there are times where you do need your economic base of the community to get back up and running very quickly because that's where people work, that's where the money comes through, that's where the jobs are and things like that. So it is fair to say that in any recovery process, the economic recovery of a community is critically important to getting that community back up on their feet. But there's also definitely, um, I think, a bias in terms of being able to manage uh, the complexity of the recovery process. If you're looking for reimbursement, if you're looking for projects to do, it's one thing when you have an organization that has a team of accountants and lawyers who can kind of sift through the paperwork and the insurance policies and things like that. But it's very different if it's someone like you or I uh, who is trying to rebuild our home and maybe hasn't looked at the insurance paperwork since it was filed away and that was lost in the flood. And then having trying to figure out what are the state procedures, what are the insurance company's requirements, what are FEMA's requirements, it creates a burden at the individual level that, that you don't have that kind of uh, um, organizational backstop that a larger corporation might have as well, too. Now, I understand that you and your team um, at the Earth Institute, that you all uh, at Columbia University, you guys have been involved for uh, long-term studies on the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy. Now, what did you find in terms of the long-term effect on the communities that were hit by the storm? Yeah, so we've actually uh, looked at not only Superstorm Sandy, but we've looked at Hurricane Katrina and the Gulf oil spill. And so we look at the long-term recovery processes after uh, any of these disasters. And so we were able to apply some of this after Sandy for some research of uh, 1,000 households in New Jersey. And what the team did was was actually conduct door-to-door -door surveys to, uh, to look at what were the impacts and what were the lasting impacts. Our center has always had a special focus on vulnerable populations, especially children in disasters. Um, and so some of the findings that we had were that uh, of the households that we interviewed, um, over a th uh, only about a third actually complied with the evacuation order. So that's really interesting right from the beginning because then it, it starts to say, well, what was the strategy for communicating evacuation? Why didn't people evacuate? Um, we saw a, a large number that required assistance. We saw drops in household incomes. Uh, we saw in some cases where, where families weren't able to afford uh, basic necessities like food, uh, transportation to and from work. But I, I think most importantly is with children Children. And in the recovery process, children are very often sort of left out of the thinking or thought of as maybe they're just small adults when in fact they actually have very unique needs. Overall, we find that children are five times more likely to suffer uh, emotional consequences and mental health issues when they're exposed to a disaster compared uh, to their counterparts who aren't exposed to a disaster. But one of the more interesting things we found in Sandy was that we did see a higher increase of those reporting uh, feeling sad or depressed after the storm uh, for those households that uh, suffered major damage, about three times more likely. Um, but, but if they suffered minor damage, they were four times or more more likely to express feelings uh, of being sad or depressed. Um, and that was really interesting because it seemed that, uh, at least in terms of the mental health of the, the children in the household, if the household was totally destroyed, um, they had, uh, they still had mental health issues, but not as high as those that only had partial damage to the household. Um, and we think that this may have to do with just the, the, um, the long-term uncertainty that the partial damage causes, the physical reminder in the home, as well as potentially even some, some health consequences related to mold and other sort of persistent issues uh, as a result of the storm. So there were nearly $9 billion in funds awarded by the federal government to New Jersey for recovery. So what did the New Jersey Sandy Transparency Project and the funds reach the people who needed it? Did that money get to those who, who were looking for it? Well, it definitely took a long time for all of the funding to reach people, uh, really in all the jurisdictions that received it. And I think that was a, a big criticism and one that we really looked at closely uh, as well on the two-year anniversary of Sandy. And certainly we've seen a lot more movement over the last two years than we have in the two years prior to that. Uh, but if you look at the, the Sandy Transparency Project, you still do see a lot of numbers there where there are still, in some cases, the money has flown through and it has gotten to where it's supposed to and all the awarded money has now been spent and obligated. But in other cases, you're seeing millions of dollars of difference that's been awarded but has yet to be obligated and yet to be spent. Um, now, in some cases, that may be appropriate because they may Maybe planning to use that money over a longer period of time. But I think it's worth asking some really important questions about 
is there money available that people need that they're not getting access to? And I think it's fair to say that, that while a lot of improvement has been made to the recovery process, we're very far from making sure that, that the money is reaching all of the people who need it and that people are able to get home and able to start their lives again. So you've actually looked at climate change and disaster preparedness at a national scale uh, for some time now. Can you talk about what you have found? Like how prepared are most Americans for disasters? Yeah, and so we look at uh, disaster preparedness, we look at climate change as potentially an amplifier for different kinds of disasters that we could face. But even if we just look at disaster preparedness alone, we find that, that since 9-11, that despite the, the billions of dollars of investment, the number of households reporting uh, that they have a disaster preparedness plan and have a disaster preparedness kit is largely unchanged. Uh, our survey that we've done uh, on national opinion data, and we've been tracking it for about 10 years now, uh, shows that number at about 35%. Now, our number is a bit lower. FEMA surveys and other surveys out there show that number at 50%. They ask the question, do you have a plan? We ask a follow-up question to ascertain the quality of that plan and if it has everything necessary. So our number is at 35%. And to be honest, I think that number is a little bit high uh, just because of some of the biases in the way that people respond to surveys. They tend to, tend to play up uh, uh, things that would otherwise be seen as negative. So we see the majority of Americans still don't have a plan or a kit in place to be prepared for disasters. Uh, we find that for children in disasters, the National Commission on Children in Disasters uh, listed recommendations five years ago to the president for improving uh, preparedness for children in disasters. But the Save the Children report card shows us that nearly 80% of those recommendations still haven't been implemented, and 18 states in the District of Columbia don't have minimum standards for preparedness for child-serving institutions. So whatever angle we look at preparedness at, um, there is good work being done out there. I don't want to take away from the hard work of the disaster professionals that are working to move the needle, but we're just not seeing it in the national data yet, that there's a, a, a tremendous amount of work to do to figure out how do we support communities in becoming more prepared through our national systems, our national policy you know when when we have those those annual national disaster preparedness or awareness weeks or days mm -hmm. etc and they always put out the checklist of stuff that you should have I I always come up pretty woefully lacking when it comes <laughs> to, to to what you actually need because you don't know. I mean, it's good that we have very good weather predicting systems now, but sometimes, I mean, you just don't know how severe these events will be until they actually hit. And by that mm -hmm. time, it's you and the entire neighborhood trying to go to the store to find some bottled water because the water has been cut off and, and a, a variety of different things can arise. So what do we need to do nationally or federally to better prepare FEMA's and the government's role and the community's ability to make sure that they are prepared when these when these disasters inevitably come. So we have a project that we're doing funded by GSK called the Resilient Children Resilient Communities Initiative. And we're actually looking at this question specific to children and disasters. And it comes down to community empowerment, that we have these national resources. But at the end of the day, as we started off this interview talking about local responders and neighbors helping neighbors, and what are we doing to support and to celebrate that? Because all disasters are inherently local. And so one of the things that we've developed is this National Children's Resilience Leadership Board. And they convened and we came up with really uh, a couple of different priorities. But I think one of the most important ones is to elevate the work that's going on in our communities. There are good examples of preparedness happening, of resilience being built. And instead of sort of trying to find answers in the C-SPAN uh, Homeland Security hearings, why don't we look into the communities that are doing this work and what kind of resources do they need? What kind of support would they benefit from, from these national systems, whether it's funding or expertise or providing exercises or inclusion in the conversation and, and allow communities to be the models for other communities. So we feel very strongly that, that it really has to begin at the community level and that the role of these national systems is ultimately, as they're designed to be, to supplement the, the local and the state systems um, in the time of the disaster. We've been speaking with Jeff Schlegel-Milch. He is the Deputy Director for the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at Columbia University's Earth Institute. Jeff, we certainly appreciate you taking some time to speak with us today. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for covering this important issue. Absolutely, and thank you for watching The Real News Network.